Good evening. If you're just joining us, my name is Alan Frazier. I am a faculty member at the University of North Dakota. And uh, we're going to pause here for about two minutes as other participants join the conference. We'll be back with you in just a couple of minutes. Good evening and welcome to the red, white, and blue military pilot career panel. We're so uh, glad that you're able to join us this evening. We're going to be visiting with six active duty military pilots. I'll give you a little idea where we're headed here for the next hour and a half. We'll start off with a brief overview of military pilot careers to include the prerequisites to be a military pilot, the testing process, what officer training is like, then we'll be talking a little bit specifically to our high school students out there and providing you with some tips uh, in order to try to make your goal come uh, true of being a military pilot. Then I'll be introducing our six distinguished panelists and then the best part comes. Our panelists will be answering your and my questions. So sit back, enjoy, and here we go. A little bit about using Zoom. So you are in the webinar format, so you won't be able to speak with the panelists, but at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q and A button. You can type your uh, questions in there. And uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Elizabeth Berkey, will be monitoring the Q&A. And I'll be asking uh, Beth occasionally to articulate questions that you have presented. And we'll uh, pitch those to one of the panelists to answer. What we would like you to avoid using is the chat and the raised hand functions. Uh, so if you have something that you'd like to communicate to the panelists, please only use the Q&A format. And again, you'll be typing your question and we will articulate, to, articulate it to them. All right, let's talk a little bit about the prerequisites to be a United States military pilot. First of all, it is a requirement to be a US citizen, to be in excellent physical condition, free of any chronic conditions, uh, distance uh, visual acuity needs to be at least 2200 correctable through surgery to 2020. Now this can change. So check with your recruiter on what the current requirements are at the time that you are looking at being a military pilot. Near vision needs to be 2020 without correction. You need to have normal color vision. 
Age requirements, they vary fairly drastically from a low of 19 years of age upon entry into flight training to a high of 35 years of age with waivers. So once again, depending upon the branch of the military that you're looking to go into, whether it be the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Air Force, Army, or the Coast Guard, make sure that you check with your officer selection officer or your military recruiter for the current standards for the branch that you are looking to enter into. Military pilot education, with very few exceptions, military pilots must possess at least a bachelor's degree. The specific college major is not crucial, and you will see that our panelists have a variety of majors. However, it is highly valued that you have taken STEM courses and a robust uh, curriculum of STEM courses. Science, technology, engineering, and math are highly valued uh, in the selection of military pilots. Again, with few exceptions, military pilots are commissioned officers or warrant officers in the case of the Army. So if you're looking to be a pilot in the military, you need to be looking at not as an enlisted grade, but as an officer grade. There are uh, pilot candidate testings, uh, and they are uh, different for each of the services, each of the branches. And you can see that the Navy and the Marine Corps what, use what they call the Aviation Selection Test Battery. The Air Force uses the Air Force Officer Qualifying Aptitude Test. The Army uses the Selection Instrument for Flight Training. And the Coast Guard presently does not have a selection instrument that they use. These the three instruments that are used by the Navy, Marine Corps, Air Force, and Army have similarities. They all are going to test your mathematical knowledge, your reading comprehension, uh, your science knowledge, your vocabulary. You'll have to solve verbal analogies and uh, also in one form or another flight related topics or interpretations of flight related information. Now, you can study for these, and there are study guides that are readily available through sources like Amazon for less than $30. And so here are the ASTB, the AFOQT, and the SIFT study guides. Officer training. Prior to going to pilot training, uh, pilot candidates must complete officer training. There's a variety of sources to do that, what we would consider commissioning sources. Service academies, such as the U.S. Air Force Academy, the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, or the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. Reserve Officer Training Corps. Air Force, Navy, and Army ROTC units serve the majority of colleges and universities in the United States. And uh, they are a commissioning source for military officers. And then finally, there is Officer Candidate School, uh, which is primarily reserved for individuals who have not participated in an ROTC program and are not attending a service academy. The Army uh, is rather unique in that they have aviators who uh, are not commissioned officers, they are warrant officers. And although there is not a requirement to have a college degree to qualify as a warrant officer, uh, it does make you much more competitive if you possess a college degree. Now, some tips for high school students. First of all, select a challenging curriculum. As we mentioned earlier, STEM courses, lots of math, lots of science. Maintain a high GPA. That's going to be a relatively large selection factor when you're competing with other students for the same officer selection positions and pilot slots. Maintain an excellent level of physical fitness. This will be tested as part of your selection process to be an officer. Participate in organized sports activity. Not only will that allow you to uh, stay in good physical condition, but it'll also uh, imbue in you teamwork and leadership. Refrain from using alcohol and illicit drugs, especially illicit drugs. That can be pretty much a kiss of death in trying to obtain a position as an officer in the US military. Try to get some leadership experience. Some sources uh, that you can tap for that leadership experience would be to get involved in junior ROTC, Army, Navy, and Air Force. 
serve as a class officer, run for a position and demonstrate your leadership potential as a school class officer, a club officer for one of the clubs or activities within your school, or as a sports team captain or co-captain. All of those activities will help you learn about leadership and build leadership skills and give you something to talk about in your interviews uh, with selection boards for the position of a US military officer. Very important is to avoid negative contacts with law enforcement, arrests and traffic citations. Basically follow the law, don't run afoul of the law. You don't wanna spend valuable time telling selection boards about your arrests or your traffic violations or having to list those items on a background investigation, which you will have to um, undergo in order to be selected as a US military officer. Prepare for the ACT and SAT exams. A good solid STEM-based education will bring you a long way towards doing well on those exams, but self-study by purchasing study guides and consider enrolling in a professional ACT or SAT preparation course. You wanna do as well as you can on those exams. Prepare for the military pilot aptitude exams using the study guides that were illustrated earlier in the presentation. If you're not in a reserve officer training corps program, reach out to your local military recruiters or officer selection offices for guidance on the selection process. They can give you a clear vision of what the process currently consists of and the different weightings of the portions of the selection process. Practice your interview skills. An ideal way of doing this is to work with uh, parents, friends, uh, and relatives to hone your interview skills. Ideally, someone who's gone through an officer selection process that can help you understand what the questions may be like and help you formulate nice, robust, complete answers to those questions. With that, it is now my privilege to introduce our six distinguished panelists. Representing the United States Air Force is Major Nathan Boone. Nathan grew up uh, in the Annandale, Virginia area. He attended Virginia Tech, graduating with a degree in business management. He currently serves as an aircraft commander and instructor pilot on the AC-130J Ghost Rider, otherwise known as a gunship. He's assigned to the 4th Special Operations Squadron at Hurlburt Field, Florida, and I'm proud to say that Nathan is my son-in-law. Next up, we have Lieutenant Aaron Coulter from the United States Navy. Uh, Aaron hails from Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. She's a proud graduate of the University of North Dakota with a bachelor's degree in commercial aviation. And she is now continuing her studies at the University of North Dakota, working on her master's degree. She flies the F-35C Lightning II and is currently assigned to VFA-125 at Naval Air Station Lemoore, California. Next up is Ca Captain Joshua Harriman, United States Army. Uh, Josh uh, grew up in the Utica, Ohio area. He also is a graduate of the University of North Dakota with a major in aeronautics. He serves as an AH-64E Apache pilot, and he's currently assigned to Fort Rucker, Alabama, where he serves in the Directorate of Evaluation and Standardization. Representing the United States Marine Corps is another UND graduate, First Lieutenant Nicholas Liebert, hails from Buffalo, Minnesota, he graduated UND with a degree in commercial aviation. He's currently assigned uh, in initial or excuse me, advanced pilot training in the AH-1 Zulu Viper, uh, previously called the Cobra, but this is the latest and greatest version of that airframe. He's assigned to a training squadron, HML LAT-303 at Camp Pendleton, California. And I'm also proud to say and privileged to know uh, Nick as a previous student in my classes at the University of North Dakota. Another representative of the United States Navy is Lieutenant Commander Brian O'Toole. Brian grew up, went to school in the La Cunada, California area. He attended the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, uh, graduating with a degree in economics. 
uh, Brian has flown both the FAA-18E Super Hornet and the F-35C Lightning II. He shares a base assignment with uh, Lieutenant Coulter. He's assigned to Carrier Air Wing II, where he currently serves as a landing signal officer, better known as PADLES. He, as we said, is assigned to Naval Air Station Lemoore, California. Also representing the United States Marine Corps, and incidentally, Brian's brother is First Lieutenant Kevin O'Toole. He's from the La Cunada, California area. He attended Texas A&M, graduated with a bachelor's degree in international studies. He shares a base assignment uh, with Nick Liebert at Camp Pendleton, California. They're both in the AH-1Z Viper Training Squadron, HLMAT-303. So please join me in welcoming our six distinguished panelists. Uh, it's been fun working with them so far, and I'm, I'm sure I'm really going to enjoy working with them here over the next hour and 15 minutes. So with that, let's get started. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and uh, you'll actually get a live view of our panelists. All right, let's start off. and. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander O'Toole, I'm going to start you off with, when did you first consider becoming a military pilot? So my older brother, Andrew, actually went to the Air Force Academy back when I was in high school, about a freshman, sophomore in high school, and he ended up not making it through. So I basically said, well, he can't do it, I can. Um, but really what it boiled down to is around the high school time frame when I started kind of thinking about what I wanted to do uh, later in life, I decided... I didn't really want to sit behind a desk uh, in a cubicle or just kind of doing a nine to five job. I wanted to go out, do something that would get me out to see the world, uh, would challenge myself. And uh, I figured being a pilot was kind of uh, the best way to do that. Nobody in my family was uh, a pilot. We didn't have any military background. And uh, after researching all the options, going to the Air Force Academy, to the Naval Academy, uh, I kind of decided at that point, I, uh, that was what I wanted to do. Understood. So a little bit of uh, brotherly, brotherly competition and also wanting to challenge yourself. That's great. Uh, Nathan, how about you? What, what got you interested in a military pilot career? Uh, so from a very young age, uh, I've been around aviation. My dad was a Marine Corps uh, C-130 pilot. And so uh, just kind of grew up in the environment. Um, he had a small airplane as well. So we'd go fly in that as a kid. Um, and so that really is where it all started. And, uh, just kind of, you know, accomplish goals along the way to, to make that happen. So through high school and college and uh, commissioning. Understood. You know, I'm really interested to get a female's perspective on this. Uh, Lieutenant Coulter, uh, when did you first become interested in becoming a military aviator? Um, it was pretty young as well. I have uh, no family at all. Uh, that's in the military. So for me, it was kind of just uh, intimidating. And I thought it looked really cool, but I had no idea how to get from point A to point B. So um, an influence for me was having friends at UND who are applying um, through OCS and encouraged me to just go give it a shot. Uh, so once I realized it was as simple as just giving it a try, uh, that's when it kind of opened up the doors for me. Understood. So I understand that was your commissioning source. You did go to officer candidate school. Is that correct? Yep, I sure did. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to toss this one at you, Kevin. Um, Kevin, what was the initial selection process like when uh, you decided that, number one, you wanted to be a Marine Corps officer and then a Marine Corps aviator? So uh, my selection process was uh, kind of convoluted. I essentially tried every single uh, possible way um, to get in. Uh, I knew I wanted to go Marines for a long time, but when I was younger, I was told, um, I was given ad date information that my eyesight wasn't good enough. So originally I was trying to get in uh, by, uh, to do Marine infantry. So graduating high school, tried to get in the Naval Academy, follow Brian's footsteps, but uh, didn't get in, went to Texas A&M. Um, outside of, uh, or at Texas A&M, I tried to get the ROTC scholarship for about five semesters in a row. Uh, that involved a lot of interviews, physical fitness tests, uh, constant updates on your GPA. Um, when you, when I was at Texas A&M, I was in the Corps Cadet, so I had to do ROTC activities, but I was applying for the scholarship. They never gave me the scholarship, so I went to the recruiter's office um, and tried to apply to OCS through there. 
Um, whenever I walked in, it was Central Texas, uh, so it's very competitive for people trying to join the Marine Corps. So I walked in, they asked for my GPA and my uh, PFT score, um, and they said, come back when, uh, when you have a max PFT score. Uh, so I came back by a semester later, I had that, um, and then they actually started working on my application. So application for that involves looking at your GPA, a bunch of interviews, a lot of letters of recommendation, um, but for OCS, the biggest uh, emphasis is the recruiter's opinion of you. So you have to have uh, make a good impression from the start and then continuously update that um, as you work with them for months or years. Uh, I eventually got selected for OCS. I uh, went to OCS between my junior and senior year of college. Uh, so it was a 10 week um, course. Um, for my, whenever I went, it was about 45% attrition rate, but most of the guys there um, who had put in the work um, to get there um, and had struggled the entire way, um, they had the motivation to succeed, so they got through. Um, so it wasn't really that bad. But after you go through OCS, uh, Marines are specific uh, or are different in that they go to a specific school. Um, in the same phrase, every Marine of riflemen, every Marine officer is supposed to be a provisional rifle platoon commander. So they go through to a six-month school called TBS. So once I commissioned, I went to TBS, still as a ground contract, um, and still thinking that I was going to go infantry. Uh, but once I got there, I was put in a holding platoon because uh, there was a uh, uh, too many people coming through the pipeline, so I had to sit around for a couple of months. And in that time, I found out I could get my eyesight fixed. Uh, so I got PRK, uh, which is a more archaic version of LASIK eye surgery. Uh, so I got that done and then he, uh, had enough time to heal that they told me that I could apply for an aviation contract if I wanted to. Uh, so through TBS, um, they took your TBS grades and scores um, and then at the very end determined if you would go uh, any MOS. And the MOS they gave me was AIR. Uh, so I went air contract, and then from there went to Pensacola, Florida, and started uh, start training. Kevin, that's like a like a rocky story. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, let's see, Josh. Uh, Josh, were you a pilot before you entered the military? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, I was actually enlisted in the Navy before, and uh, did my uh, commercial or uh, private pilot training in San Diego on my off time. Before I went to UND. Okay, and then uh, you went to UND, and did you switch over to helicopters at UND, or, or, or maybe that you were in helicopters at San Diego? I don't know. No, I flew airplanes first, and then um, I was looking into joining the Army, so I took one helicopter flight, which changed the entire direction of my life. So, um, chose to go helicopters after that first flight, and it's been awesome ever since. Right on. Um, in, in becoming a military aviator after going through a collegiate aviation program, uh, was that helpful to you or how would you kind of rate whether or not it gave you a head, uh, kind of a, a leg up on the other guys? Uh, I feel like I've been ahead of my peers for well, because of UND um, the whole time. Um, maybe not so much anymore now that everyone's got you know, similar experiences, but uh, definitely an initial flight training, um, being a commercial helicopter pilot before I started was very helpful. Um, UND's got a great program there, obviously, where they paid for all my flight training in college. So I showed up to um, initial training here at Fort Rucker as a commercial helicopter pilot already. Obviously, that helps, um, you know, with guys that haven't flown before, you know, when you're competing against each other you know having that that leg up definitely helped me um, succeed and get to where I want to be. Understood so uh, that's the program I think that we at least informally refer to as air battle captain right so then you got to Rucker and you had to go through some challenge flights basically to check your skills is that correct? Yeah so typically when you join the army and do flight training, go through the flight training, you're gonna do primary, which is where you learn to hover a helicopter. You know, um, it's your basic course. It's almost like earning your private pilot's license. And then after that, you'll do instrument training. So learning to fly in clouds without you know, reference to the ground. And then after we get through that, we go into what we call basic war fighting skills, which is teaching you to be an army aviator. So flying low, map on your, on your lap, navigating and, and moving the targets and things like that. So, um, but being a UND graduate, we got to you basically skip the primary phase and the instrument phase. You do a few flights, they give you a check ride, call you good, and then you're off to BWS, you know, learn to fly tactically. 
Wonderful. What a, what a great advantage. Nick, I know you're a UND grad as well, but you went to, to another branch. You went to the Marine Corps. So what's your perception of uh, having gone to an aviation-oriented university, and, and did that help you, hinder you? What would you say? I Honestly, I kind of lucked out and fell into it because I originally going to the University of North Dakota. I just I, – I knew I wanted to become like some kind of – I originally was looking into the Army and then doing the Army RTC because I was just trying to find a way to – join the military because I just like the stability and then the idea of uh, serving. And it wasn't until I went to University of North Dakota where it's just like, I don't know, maybe 40% of the people there are into aviation. And then doing the ROTC program there, I just worked hard and then did really well my first year. And I was, uh, it's when they just ended the helicopter flight training program. So I was kind of uh, about heard about that. Uh, so then I was trying to find other ways. So I was also in the National Guard and they were helping pay for school. Um, so then I went and I got like the post 11 GI Bill from a deployment. And then I was kind of like looking into what options I had. And uh, I, I just talked to a few Marine uh, or talked to the, the Marine recruiter. Actually, uh, I, I met him going into your class like the first day. So then it just kind of fell into it. But he was telling me it was like guaranteed aviation slot where they could do that with the HFTP uh, with the ROTC when they had that. Uh, but then they discontinued, which uh, I know it's like that. And then I believe Navy can offer uh, when you sign up to go guaranteed aviation. And so since I went out and I started uh, paying for aviation, uh, I, I figured I'd try to go with the Marine Corps and which I, I feel like I've been very fortunate with it because I really liked uh, coming down to Pensacola to learn how to fly and then learning how to fly the TH-57 which was a sweet aircraft learning to fly the, the Bell 206 and then now getting stationed out at Camp Pendleton is has been amazing but yeah I've, I've, I've loved everything about it so far and then it, it just kind of like once just kept pushing and kind of one thing led to another and uh, just got to get the Cobra West Coast. Yeah, awesome. I've never told you this, but uh, uh, when the class left and I was talking to the captain and he goes, oh, it seems like a sharp young man because you would talk with him after classroom. And I said, you want to get this guy. You, you want to <laughs> recruit this guy into the Marine Corps. And I'm so glad that it worked out for you. I always see a smile on your face when you, you make posts and it looks like you're having a great career there. Absolutely love it. So, all right. Hey, back to you, Josh. Uh, where'd you go to initial pilot training? So I did an initial pilot training right here at Fort Rucker, which I'm back now as an instructor um, seven years later. But uh, it's about two hours north of Major Boone there at Hurlburt Field. So we're two, mile, two hours north of, of the beach uh, in Alabama here. There you go. Not too shabby. Uh, and since you mentioned uh, uh, Lieutenant Boone there, uh, Nathan, where, where did you do your initial pilot training? So I started off, um, I actually came into the Air Force with a commercial, um, with a commercial rating uh, from the civilian side, which again, anybody that flies uh, prior to going into the military, uh, it, it does give you a leg up um, compared to your peers. Not so much just as the, for the application process, but when you're going through flight training, um, having that air sense, having that experience really helps. And it just puts you loose and bounds uh, ahead of guys that you're going through with. I went to initial pilot training out at Laughlin Air Force Base in Del Rio, Texas, and then followed up with uh, Corpus Christi uh, with the Navy, uh, where I got my wings, and then on to C-130 school at, uh, uh, at Little Rock before I came to Herbert. Very good. Thank you. We're going to pause here just a moment and uh, bat the tennis ball over to Beth. Beth, uh, any questions for us from the audience? Yeah, it looks like we've got quite a few great questions coming in. If you want, I can address the first one to Lieutenant Coulter. Uh, someone's asking, how much flight training did you have before, or did you have before you got to fly the F-35? Obviously the F-35 hasn't helped me with technology at all, but uh, <laughs> so uh, civilian wise, I went through the commercial uh, aviation degree at UND and then all of the Navy's um, primary and advanced uh, training. And then I actually flew the F-18 for about uh, five years or four years probably um, before I transitioned to the F-35. So I've only been flying the F-35 for almost exactly a year now. 
Um, so yeah, uh, any clarification on that? Good, thank you. Here's a great question for all of you that Nick sent in. It says, what is the most challenging aspect of the respective aircraft that you fly? And also what is the most rewarding part of that flying? Why don't we bat that around a little bit? Uh, why don't we go to Josh on helicopters in the age 64? Sure. Uh, well, I think there are a couple most challenging phases. It kind of depends on when you're flying. Um, but uh, learning to fly night system in the Apache is probably the most challenging for students. So you're, you've got one monocle over your right eyeball and your eyeball is an electronic sensor about I don't know, six, 10 feet out in front of you. Um, so I learned to fly at night. Night sensor is definitely challenging. If you ever watch the movie Firebirds, wouldn't recommend it, but uh, it's it's a, not a great movie, but they do have a, what we call the bag, um, where we have guys learn to fly night system during the daytime. So they're completely blocked in their cockpit, they can't see outside, and they're learning to fly off of that sensor in the cell phone. So that's pretty challenging. Um, but uh, shooting is also pretty challenging, but also the most most fun part of the job. And uh, obviously, anytime that you're uh, supporting ground forces overseas, I think that's the most rewarding part. Um, even, you know, checking in and talking to these guys that are down there on the ground, making them feel a little bit better, you know, providing support. Uh, that's obviously the most rewarding. Well, thanks so much. Nathan, I see you nodding your head there in agreement to Joshua, and I know you have a little bit of time downrange there, right? So what's your perspective on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, most uh, rewarding is definitely uh, work with the ground parties and um, actually seeing the, uh, the fruits of your labor uh, downrange when you go and support those guys. Um, as far as the most challenging, I would say it's, you know, kind of one of the biggest challenges in any type of leadership organization is dealing with people. Um, on the gunship, we got, you know, pretty big crew, 10 folks on there. And so uh, managing different uh, personality traits and uh, different ideas is, uh, is probably the most challenging. Very good. You know, from a naval perspective, I'm really interested to hear from Brian and Aaron. Uh, we'll start off with Brian. Uh, what's the most challenging thing you do as a naval aviator? Well, currently, uh, I'm in a unique situation where uh, I'm one of I think three people in Lemoore who flies both the F-35 and the F-18 on a daily basis. So the most challenging part of my flying is just going back and forth between the two. Um, the F-35 was designed a lot of it off of the uh, F-16, so Air Forcey, and the F-18 was purely Navy. So simple things like the F-18's got a center stick and the F-35's got a side stick. And I went off the end of the carrier a couple months ago and an F-18 and reached to the side where there was no stick and thought my stick had fallen off and realized I was an engineer. So <laughs> I've kind of uh, brought that upon myself. Uh, overall, it's, it's each aircraft is a little bit different. So the F-35, uh, I would say it's easy to land on the boat. So that's not necessarily a difficult portion, uh, but it's a new aircraft and a new platform. So a lot of the difficulties with that uh, airplane have to do with you feel sometimes like you're in a test platform almost. Uh, so a lot of stuff is new. It's ongoing, the software updates, hardware updates. Uh, when it goes to the F-18, uh, one of the more difficult things used to be landing on the carrier and it still kind of is. Uh, there's a new software uh, update coming out where it's gonna be a lot easier. Um, but overall, I would say before about a year ago, the hardest thing that uh, I would have to do would be landing on an aircraft carrier just cause it's always moving and it's moving away from you and it's moving away into the right, and it's moving up and down, uh, and it's dark, and um, yeah, I say landing on the aircraft carrier. Understood. I, I love the perspective, though, on the two different airframes and the side controller versus the stick. That was a great antidote. Aaron, how about uh, from your perspective? Is it is it landing on the boat, or is it something else? Um, landing on the boat is definitely challenging. I think one of the funniest parts of landing on the boat is everybody on the boat it feels like everybody's watching you and like on the boat we have screens that have our last names up and so everyone knows when you're coming down the chute and i think at first that took a while for me to get over it's like oh man if i bolter everyone's gonna <laughs> know that it's me uh, so i didn't like that at first uh but once you get over and uh over that and confident in yourself that you can do it 
Uh, I think it's definitely challenging, but it's also the most fun thing that we do, I think, in the Navy is flying out of the boat in general. Um, as far as like F-35 challenges, um, things with that specifically, like coming from the F-18 into the F-35 with uh, and experiencing new stuff with that. Uh, F-35, I think is like information overload. It has so much awareness around you and like all the symbology in your helmet all the time. And sometimes it's like overwhelming, but it's also on the flip side, really cool because you have a lot of information that you can process uh, all the time. So that's pretty neat. Um, and then like Brian was saying, the new development of just the Navy learning how they want to use the F-35 and the tactics of the F-35. Uh, like it seems like just since I've been flying in the last year, everything has like changed like two or three times. I'm just like, oh my God, you learn something and then it's like, oh, well actually we're going to do this now. So that's um, a challenge for sure. Understood. I can only imagine. I'm going to go to uh, the guys that are now uh, training in their advanced airframe. That'd be Kevin and uh, Nick. Um, uh, Kevin, um, tell us uh, an average day uh, in training for the Viper. What, what does a, a training day look like for you? So training in uh, HMLT 303 is different uh, than training up until this point. Uh, so through primary and advanced, you would go through long ter uh, periods where you weren't doing anything at all. You were just in a, a waiting. Uh, and then whenever you would start flying, you'd have had plenty of time to prepare. Uh, but by the time you get to this point, um, the pipeline's a little more rushed, so you're flying uh, quite often. Uh, and then there's a combination uh, or addition of having a ground job as well. So an average day, I would say, is uh, you come in as early as you can in the morning, probably around like 7.30, uh, and then you start your ground job. I work in the, uh, the S2 and the S6. Uh, those are the shops for intelligence communication. And you just you sit in that shop uh, for as long as you need, helping whoever uh, comes in or getting done whatever work you need to do uh, until you go to your brief. Your brief uh, can be at any time of the day. Uh, for mine, they've mostly been morning, so probably about 10.30, uh, I'll head over uh, for an 11 o'clock brief. That brief lasts about two hours. Uh, after that brief, 30 minutes later, uh, you'll put on your gear and walk to the aircraft. Uh, most flights, at least where I am, uh, last about two hours. Uh, you do that flight, come back, land, um, and then the debrief can last anywhere from five minutes to an hour and a half. Uh, so whatever time you're done with that, if the office hours are still uh, open, then you'll go back to your office and continue working. Uh, if not, then you'll go home and prep for, prep for the next day. It sounds like we're getting our money's worth out of you, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, Nick, I'm going to have you roll back a little bit. So I'm, I don't, I'm guessing it's at least a couple of months ago, but sometime in the past, you were down at, at beautiful Pensacola rather than out at Camp Pendleton. And think back to that and tell us an average day when you were doing primary flight training down there at Pensacola. So back in Pensacola, we were probably flying three, four times a week uh, at most. So it would be nice to get like a day in between each flight. So the first phase, uh, obviously, it was just kind of like contacts where you're just going to go out to an outlying field and you're going to practice uh, pretty much, uh, the, yeah, the 57. I remember they had it uh, back at uh, the Bell 206 back at UND for a while. Uh, and you just kind of practice, like, learn the auto rotation, learn how to hover and whatnot. And then uh, I think that's honestly the best time we're going to be instrument pilots as well, because right after we do all the fam, we'll do a little bit of tactic stuff where we'll uh, work with uh, a, um, a crew member. And then we'll uh, pick up like, an external load, which is like a 50 gallon or like a five gallon bucket with some concrete in it. We just set it, set it down and pick it back up. That's probably the only time I'll ever do that, but it was pretty cool. And then land on like a, a pinnacle or a hill. And then, uh, which honestly we, we did that uh, flying at UND as well. Uh, so I think I, I got to give uh, UND some credit. It was a lot of fun there. Uh, so it was kind of similar uh, to UND in that aspect. And then the it was it was kind of cool because the it was the 206 was actually instrument rated, so we actually actually got to get some uh, instrument time. Um, but then, but then we actually uh, take like a a test that's similar to the FA. So like after I finish flight school, uh, advanced, then I, I got to get my uh, commercial and instrument rating for fixed wing and helo. Uh, so I probably got a total of. 200 hours, 100 hours in the T6, 100 hours in uh, 57. Uh, so it probably took like two years total uh, down in Pensacola doing that training. And then, yeah, just, just got out here. I had my first flight in the Cobra today. So big day. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Beth, back to you. Uh, questions from the audience, man. 
Yeah, we had a great question that came in about the selection process during undergraduate pilot training. If I think that'd be a good one for the audience to hear about. How does it work? How do you get put into your airframes? And Nathan, you want to take a shot at that one? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so on the Air Force side, uh, the question is asking um, about the split after T6s. So uh, your first phase of pilot training is in T6s, and it's again right around uh, 80 hours or so. And then you uh, track select. And so you can track select either uh, T38s, T1s. Uh, my information is a little dated, uh, but uh, right uh, when I went through, you could also go down to Corpus Christi and do uh, C12s or T44s with the Navy. Or you go to Fort Rucker and uh, learn to fly helicopters uh, with the Army. So your, uh, sorry, the question just went away. Um, let's see here where to go. Um, I think it was focused on uh, like going to your advanced airframe. Yep. So what's, what are the decision points there, Nathan? So depending on how you do, everything's great. Every flight is graded. So when you're in T6s, um, your contact rides, how you fly acrobatics, how you fly formation, how you fly instruments, uh, all those rides are graded. And then you take a check ride at the end of that phase. And uh, so the check ride grades plus all your daily rides go into a calculation and they spit out a number. And at the end of T6s, they say, hey, who wants um, uh, T1s, who wants T38s, who wants uh, helicopters? And based upon your score, how you rack and stack against your, your classmates, that determines where you go. Um, so I would say that T38s were harder to get, um, but uh, that was just really because of the, of the numbers. So of the 28 that we started with, I think we tracked 18. And of that 18, it was probably five went T38s, two guys went to Fort Rucker, um, five of us went to Corpus and then the rest got T1. So the majority of guys went uh, T1s and it's probably still the same numbers now. A very small portion goes uh, helicopters and flies uh, the um, uh, Huey there at uh, Fort Rucker. And then uh, the rest, uh, you know, the small percentage went uh, 38s. Let's see here. Uh, and that, again, that information is dated. I think uh, baseops.net uh, for this uh, individual, I think baseops.net publishes uh, publishes um, the different tracks and the numbers as well as what airframes guys are getting out of uh, uh, out of their classes in the Air Force. So that's a place for gouge. If guys want to go take a look at that, again, that's uh, baseops.net. Very good. Thank you. We'll stay with you just a moment. Uh, Beth, you have another question from the audience for us? Yeah, we're getting a lot of great questions looking at ROTC versus OCS versus the academies and the pros and the cons. And I think that might be a great discussion. Great. You know, I'll, I'll pitch the first one there to, uh, to Nick. Uh, Nick, so you went through uh, basically OCS, but PLC, uh, and you also had some exposure to Army ROTC. So what's your perspective on that? It was a little bit different as far as like the culture, a little bit. Uh, Army's a little bigger uh and i don't know it was it was kind of like a little more gung-ho with marine corps which was kind of up my alley and like uh and so i i, I liked I, I really liked that a lot um but it was yeah as far as like atmosphere i would say that the ocs was very humbling uh it, it was it was a, a little different but i, I definitely feel like I, I met some of like the best people I met, like, I think that was like a great, like one of those, like when you're going through like the leadership traits, like I feel like I really got a lot out of the OCS and along with, with the TBS as well. Uh, and then I, th I think ROTC was a, was a great program uh, as well. It was just, it was, it was structured a little different because like ROTC, you're kind of like going into classes and then you're playing pretend army in between where OCS, like you kind of feel like you're in your own world. And like, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel like you're on earth. Like, it's just like, it's kind of chaotic. <laughs> Come, and then you just like leave summer camp with a bunch of great friends. And then you, and then you, just, you see them all the next summer and then TBS. Uh, so you almost kind of get like a brotherhood uh, that way through it. Uh, but yeah, I, I'll just kind of leave it that. Uh, Marines, they definitely uh, really like to hype themselves up with like the, we, we, we every Marine's a rifleman. So I, I, I thought the, the TBS uh, six months of learning how to be like an infantry officer 
uh, was a great experience on top of pilot skills. And I think that it'll translate over to the real world real nicely for someone who would go through that. Understood. Thank you. Brian, I'm going to kind of refocus that question to you. So you went through a service academy, United States Naval Academy. Can you tell uh, our viewers a little bit about that? I did. So uh, it's kind of going down a very similar route there where it's field where you can go kind of not part time, but uh, you know, RTC versus OCS versus the academy. The academy is basically 24 seven all the time, uh, right out of high school. So uh, unless you join later, go to a regular college, a real college first. Um, you're basically, you're in the military without getting the, I wouldn't say the perks, um, but you have to, you know, submit leave requests. Uh, yeah, you're going to class, but you've got formation every day, multiple times a day. Uh, you're basically fully immersed in that military lifestyle, which has its goods and its bads, um, but it's just one route. Uh, the thing about the academy is uh, you can't go to the academy and say, hey, I'd like to go. And after four years, I want a pilot spot. And I'm not going to go unless you get a pilot spot. You're going to go in there and you're going to go in the pool with everybody else in your class. And you're going to get ranked depending on how well you do militarily, how well you do, uh, you know, in regards to your class's GPA and kind of overall. And then you just put in your preferences and uh, they tell you what you're going to do. So there are people who go there and they go uh, all gung-ho. Hey, I'm going to go there. I'm going to be a Marine. And, you know, say out of a class of 1,200, I'm going to say about 200, uh, maybe get a Marine spot. And they're just not, not one of those 200, and they're going to get stuck on a ship. And that's what they have to do for the next five, six years of their life. Uh, they're going to have to do what, what their job that they got selected for. So I got lucky. Uh, I got a pilot spot, which is going in what I wanted. But it can go either way where you're going to go when you're going to end up with something that you don't want. Like everything else in life, just like flight school, if you go to flight school, you're dead set on one platform. Uh, you have to be ready that you're not going to get it. You can get something else, but you still have a little bit of control over that in that you can do really well. And if you finish number one in your class, you know, there's a 99.9% .9 chance you're going to get what you want. So if you finish number one in college at the Naval Academy, you're probably going to get what you want. If you finish number one in flight school, you're probably going to get what you want. So uh, you, it's not just throwing it to the wind and whatever comes back is what you're going to get. You can try really hard, work really hard, and you will reap the benefits if you do really well. Um, yeah. yeah. Great advice. It sounds to me like some advice I got many years ago, and it was an analogy regarding water. You know, you heat water to 210 degrees, you don't, you got hot water, right? You get it to 212 and it boils. And, you know, I think that's really what it's about. You've got to strive to do your absolute individual best to, to get what you want out of life. Josh, I'm going to uh, pitch this next one to you. I, I know that you've uh, served in a war zone, and uh, I'm sure some of our listeners would like to hear about that. What was it like to be deployed in a war zone? Uh, it's fun. So I'll say it's, it's challenging. Obviously, you're away from your family, but um, I think everyone joins, well, I would say most people join the military because they want to do uh, things like that go to combat, you know. Um, so it's it feels like your hard work has kind of paid off, and you get the opportunity to go deploy. Um, so I think it's great. Um, obviously, long days, you know, twelve, fourteen plus um, is pretty normal. <clears throat> um, but um, you fly a lot when you're deployed. You're getting to do your job, which is great. You're working with ground forces, like I said earlier, it's the most rewarding part of the job. So um, I think being deployed is kind of what most guys are, are looking for. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Nathan, I'm going to pose the same question to you from an Air Force perspective. You've been downrange many times. Uh, what's, what's it like being in a combat zone from an Air Force pilot's perspective? Well, like Josh mentioned, uh, you get to really, your, all your training comes to the forefront at that point, you're all the things you've trained for, you get to go do. So you get to actually go out and, and do the real mission, uh, which is rewarding. It really is. Um, on the, uh, <laughs> uh, as, like you said, as far as long days, it is long days. It's a lot of flying. Uh, it's, um, but it is rewarding, very rewarding getting to go, go do the actual job. Thank you, Aaron. Um, you know, you and uh, Brian uh, have, have a unique, part of your duties, which is to go out on a big boat and, and launch off that. What's that like? What's it like being on an aircraft carrier and being deployed in a war zone, which I, I know you've been there? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, being on the aircraft carrier itself, I guess you could 
pretty much equate it to like Groundhog Day. It always feels like the same. There's always the same noises going at like all times of the day. It's just a city that's constantly operational. I, I really liked deployment and being on the boat. Life is very simple. You're, you're unplugged from the internet and the choice of whatever you want on Netflix. It's just like you could read a book or you could talk to your friends and uh, you, it's hard for people to communicate with you. So your family, like if you want to answer the email, you can, or you can wait a couple hours because the internet was down. So there's a lot of excuses like that, which uh, is good and bad sometimes. And then uh, another thing I really enjoyed about deployment was that there's no dishes. You just go, you eat chow, you sit with all your homies, you eat for as long as you want. You may, might even go back a second time. And at the end of it, you just put your platter on the, on the little thing and say thanks and you don't have to do dishes. So that's definitely a good thing about deployment. As far as uh, being in a war zone on deployment, uh, I mean, you're out, I was in the Persian Gulf most of the time, so Iran likes to play uh, their games with the Navy out there, so that was always uh, interesting. Um, and then as far as flying off the carrier, uh, I think it adds some transit time, I would say, for us. Our missions were about seven, seven and a half hours most of the time uh, to get to where we were going. Um, and back, so um, that causes some uh, boredom airborne, I guess. Uh, hard to go to the bathroom airborne, uh, but otherwise, um, yeah, that's, it was a good, it was a definitely a good experience. I learned a ton about just the world in general from uh, being stuck on a boat and looking at a map about where I was in the world and what was going on around me, so it was pretty cool. Thank you. Well, we're going to stay with the Navy here for just a moment. Uh, Brian, you alluded to this when you were talking about the most difficult things you've done. You mentioned the transition between the FAA 18 and the F-35, but you also uh, mentioned landing and uh, launching off the boat. So tell us about that. What's it like to launch uh, from a carrier deck and what's it like to recover on the carrier deck? So launching is a lot more fun than recovering because there's no skill involved in launching. You just basically go full power and then hold on as as you can and the boat will take care of the rest. Uh, there's not much you can do until you get airborne. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. Uh, I quit it kind of like the, there's an old ride at Six Flags called Superman where you just sit there and you just go straight as fast as you can uh, up and then backwards back down. It, you can't really, it's hard to put into words the exhilaration and the feeling you get going from zero to you know 150 plus knots in a span of a couple seconds. Uh, it throws you back in your seat. It feels amazing. I've had I think 315 plus uh, catapults and traps and I still I uh, turn down my ICS because I scream every time I go off the front like in excitement it's a, it's a good time um, coming back around to landing it's daunting at first uh, it is scary especially when you see going through flight school and training you see all the videos of the crashes and the things that can happen uh, because there really is no room for error uh, if you land you know, five feet left of center line or five feet right of center line. You can clip another jet. You can clip an aircraft uh, that's parked outside the landing area. Uh, so there's not really a whole lot of room for air. If you're a couple feet below glide slope, you're going to fly into the back of the boat. If you're a couple feet above glide slope and you land too far and your rear wheels hit the flight deck and your nose wheel misses, and then you'll basically go end uh, front uh, down, basically flip end over end and into the water. Uh, if you eject forward of the aircraft carrier, then the ship's going to run over you. Nothing you can do about it. So you got a lot of things that can go wrong that are terrifying, but like everything else in aviation, you just compartmentalize and you say, hey, I gotta land on the boat because that's where the food is and I'm hungry. And you go back to your training and you stick uh, with what you know and you've got LSOs out there and CAG paddles like myself to kind of help talk you down. If the ship's moving around a lot, uh, if it's nighttime, if you're struggling behind the boat, then there's people out there who can help you. But in the end, really it lies uh, with you there in the airplane. You're the one who's manipulating the throttles. So you're the one who's moving the stick. And uh, really, once you touch down and the arrestment takes you by surprise, ideally, because you've been flying the ball, barely, fly the ball, beat the ball, uh, then kind of like the launch in reverse, there's not much you can do other than just hold on. You'll go flying forward in your seat. If your harness isn't locked, then your face is going to hit the HUD or uh, the glare shield. And you're going to come to a stop. It's very violent and you're gonna come to a stop, you're gonna go full power, you look around, 
you kind of get your bearings and you realize that there's somebody, you know, 10 feet from your airplane telling you to throttle back and put your hook up. So you're right back in it, uh, right back to taxing. So it's, it's quite a bit different just being on the aircraft carrier in regards to how close you are to everything else. A lot of uh, aviation uh, pilots or students, they're used to being around an airport where if you're closer than 100 feet from the airplane, then he's too close. You know, you're not going to be taxing near somebody else. You're not going to be taken off. If there's somebody uh, past the hold short, like you got plenty of room and on the aircraft carrier, I mean, you're folding your wings and uh, you're taxiing feet from somebody else. Uh, there's people running behind you underneath your airplane and uh, there'll be times they're going to tax you and your nose wheel is located behind you uh, where you're seated in the seat. So you're actually, your body is going to be hanging over the water and you're trusting that that yellow shirt over there, the uh, taxi director is going to have you turn your steering wheel, your nose wheel inches from the uh, scupper from going over the edge of the aircraft carrier and you're trusting your life to him because if you go over the edge then uh, you're going to go in the water so it's uh it's exhilarating it's fun but uh it is dangerous and um you really got to compartmentalize long answer uh, that's an excellent answer it sounds very very exciting uh, josh we're going to go back to basics a little bit uh this one's for you sir uh what do you like most about being a military pilot Uh, <clears throat> what I like most about being a military pilot is, um, I guess, getting to do my dream job. Um, this has been exactly what I wanted to do for a very long time, flying Apache specifically, and I got very lucky um, to be able to do that. And uh, I'm probably the luckiest guy I know when it comes to that. So I would just say, in general, uh, the, the best part about my job is that I don't feel like I work. That's truly a blessing. I felt that way many times in positions that I've worked. So that's great to hear. Uh, Kevin, um, a little less experience uh, in the military than Josh has. What would you say is your favorite part so far about being a uh, uh, Marine Corps aviator? Well, uh, there's a, a lot of different things I like about it. Um, I can't say for sure uh, what I like the most, um, but there's the intangibles, obviously, um, sense of patriotism, um, everybody wants to know that what they're doing uh, matters. Uh, so it's nice waking up in the morning knowing you're not just doing a dead end job. Um, and then there's also the, uh, the obvious ones, just the thrill of flying. Anyone who goes in uh, has to have that thrill for flying and uh, flying in Southern California along the beach line at less than 100 feet is, uh, is something you can't really replace um, with anything else. So I really like that. Plus, uh, every time you fly that low, I'm sure Josh knows. Um, you get to see people's faces on the ground as they look up and wave at you and take photos of you. So it's kind of an ego booster there. Um, but yeah, just flying, flying at all, uh, especially here is what I love most. Right on. Well, you probably know I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to flip it now and say, what do you like least about being a military pilot? Uh, like the least. Um, so I don't even have as much, I don't have as much time uh, or fleet experiences uh, really anybody else in this panel. Um, but even at the level that I'm at, the uh, thing I like the least is just the amount of uh, uh, freedom and time you have away from family and friends. Um, so, I mean, a combination of being in the military and also being under quarantine uh, with this whole virus thing, you're very limited uh, in where you can, uh, who you can see and when you can see them. So leave is really not an option at all. Um, and throughout my whole time in, since I commissioned 2016, I've had to prioritize my career over uh, personal relationships, uh, friendships, uh, you just have to understand that you're not going to be seeing uh, your friends and family nearly as much as you'd probably like to. Understood. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to you, Beth. Uh, do you have a couple of questions from the audience for us, please? Yeah, we have a great question from Jack. He wants to know, what is your mo what was your most exciting mission? Boy, well, let's take one of the more experienced pilots. Uh, Josh, I see you kind of nodding your head like you have a story in mind there for us. So Josh, what would you say your most exciting mission was? I would say most exciting is probably, um, like I said earlier, I'm one of the luckiest guys I know. So my very first flight after flight school was in Afghanistan. Um, so, I will say the most exciting is getting to go there and do your job right away. Um, uh, to be able to support our ground guys, to be able to provide, provide some protection. Um, eight hours in a helicopter after, you know, initial flight training where you're flying about uh, 1.5 most days. 
So eight hours is quite a change. Um, but uh, anytime you're getting to fly in Afghanistan or you know, wherever they're sending you across the world, um, it's always exciting. Very good. Well, I think this one really lends itself to kind of going around the horn here a little bit. So Nathan, from an Air Force perspective, uh, what would you say your most exciting mission was? Um, it's a pretty exciting mission. Um, there, there was a night in Afghanistan where we, uh, we were kind of short on gas. The tankers dropped out and uh, they kind of dropped out on us last minute there. So uh, seeing truly how far you can fly a C-130 uh, on low gas in Afghanistan was, uh, was pretty exciting. It's a pretty exciting time. Um, other than that, uh, no, honestly, I went 145 combat missions. Uh, they've all been exciting, to be honest. Even the dull nights are still exciting. They're long too. I know you've related to me, you know, you take, you take off at uh, dusk, right? And you yeah. tank a couple of times and you come home for breakfast in the morning. So what's the, what's the length of a mission and how many times do you tank? Uh, the longest was uh, 10.2 with three tankers. So. Uh, impressive. Aaron, uh, from the Navy perspective, uh, ma'am, what would you say your most exciting mission was? Uh, I would have to agree with both Josh and Nathan. Like they were all super exciting. It's always a mystery what's going to happen once you get out over country and things can change so fast or you can just sit there and just hope something's going to happen uh, the whole time you're out there. But like the first time you're doing it, it's just like crazy. Every time you're like, oh my gosh, I just flew for eight hours. I just tanked three times. I just landed on an aircraft carrier. Like I was just over Syria. Like this is crazy every single time. So it's always a challenge. It's always a super fun adventure, I thought. Uh, great points. And it, it's it's so obvious to look at how engaged you are, uh, that you love your jobs. And it, it makes me proud to be an American that uh, we have military members that love their jobs like that. It makes me feel safe. Uh, Aaron, I'm going to stay with you. Uh, from uh, a college student's perspective, what two or three pieces of advice would you give them if they want to pursue the career that you're having so much fun in? Um, I would just say, like I talked about earlier, just like, don't be intimidated by it. I know 10 years ago, I never would have seen myself where I am now. I probably had never even heard of the F-35. So things can change a lot and you have to just give it a shot. So this is a pretty cool forum to kind of introduce people uh, to options and how to get from A to B. So uh, hopefully we've answered your questions with that and uh, just don't don't be intimidated by it. You can't get there if you don't try. So uh, first step is to figure out how you're going to do it. Excellent. Josh, what would you add to that? What advice would you give to an aspiring college student who wants to be a military aviator? I'd say go to UND. I'm just saying. Um, honestly, going to UND was probably the best decision I've ever made in my life. Um, now, there are a lot of great options, you know, as you've heard from almost everyone here, um, but uh, choosing a program and then just working hard, obviously learn how to study because that's gonna help you in flight school as well. Um, just like um, these guys have said, um, you know, the better you can do in college, the better you can do in flight school, you know, just putting in the work, really. Um, if it's something that you want to do, then, you know, do it. Um, I know for a long time, uh, I didn't, like Erin uh, had said, you know, she didn't see herself doing that. I saw myself doing it, but I didn't know that uh, it was possible. It didn't really feel possible. Um, so I'll say it's very possible, you know, if it's something that you want to do, put the work in and then um, look into all the options and figure out what's going to be best for you because we need pilots uh, and we need people that want to do it. So, um, but yes, UND, guarantee aviation in the Army, helicopter spot, kind of kind of hard to say no to that. Pretty awesome. Right on. Thanks. And uh, thanks for the, uh, the plug of UND. 
Uh, we're trying to be agno trying to be agnostic, but <laughs> eh, when you're the best, it's hard to be, right? So, <laughs> in any case, um, Kevin and Nick, I'm going to toss this one to you. You're a little closer to high school than uh, some of your more senior uh, colleagues here. So I'll start off with you, Kevin. What uh, advice would you give to high school students that aspire to be military pilots? Well, the advice I'd give to high school students is a little different than the advice I'd give to uh, college students. So for high school students, the two biggest things I'd say, uh, it sounds simple and sounds obvious, but uh, try and care. When you're in high school, there's a lot of peer pressure and uh, it can sometimes uh, seem like the way to fit in is to just be the guy who's so chill and cool because he like doesn't care, like doesn't try, he's just super relaxed. So don't fall into that. Uh, don't fall into um, uh, a crowd of people that uh, will promote that idea. Um, be the guy who's driven. So easy things, work out, learn how to develop friendships uh, everywhere you go. Um, and be the kind of person that people want to work with, whether it's because of your personality or because of your competence, uh, preferably both. Um, just be that person that people know uh, is reliable. On top of that, I'd say uh, start talking to a recruiter early um, just to get information, just to be up to date and always have that in the background so you don't lose focus on what you want. Um, but as an addendum to that, make sure that recruiter doesn't push you or rush you into something that you don't want. Uh, just get contact early and, uh, and keep trying. It's going to be a couple years. Great advice. I'm seeing a common vein here and everyone seems to me to be saying the same thing and that's go 110%. Give your absolute best uh, to, to accomplish what you want to get. And uh, that's such great advice. Nick, what can you add to what Kevin said there? Uh, uh, words of wisdom for high school students. I kind of almost got swindled into just uh, settling uh, with just like going active duty army. And then I just kind of, you just, you should definitely look into all the options out there. Uh, that's why I did the national guard. Uh, so that way I could do army RTC. So just being aware of everything. Cause I was just like some eight, like I, I knew I didn't want to be stuck in Buffalo, Minnesota working construction. So I was just like military is my, my way out. I got to go to college. So then just, just being uh, familiar with all your options out there. So I'd recommend trying to get the military to help pay for your college. And then once you're in college, definitely like do your best because, and just look at the big picture. So if like, if you do your best, beat out your, uh, beat out your peers, you're going to get the job you want. So that's where it's just like, I may have not done the best in high school, but when I got to, when I finally got to college, I, I was just like, I know what I want to do. I see they got a great programs here at UND. Aviation is uh, what everyone's doing like I want to do that I'm going to put all my effort into it and you do well and like you, before you know it like I didn't I obviously I, didn't, I had no idea what I was going to do going into college but then uh, there's like a lot of great leaders like mentors there at any college UND uh, and then I you see like you just talk to people see it's possible to do it uh, work hard uh, towards it and then before you know it you're in Camp Pendleton flying a Cobra so right on work. Yeah, right on. Thank you again. Is that that message of 110 uh, percent? It just is across the board. Let's uh, change gears here a little bit and talk about the personal aspect of it, Brian. Uh, uh, how has a military, being a military pilot, affected your personal life? Uh, significant other, spouse, travel, gaining or losing friends? So it's uh, it definitely has an effect. Um, you're not going to be the guy, you know, I go back home to my hometown um, and I would see the same people in the same bars who hadn't left for years. You're not going to be that guy. You're going to be traveling around a lot, uh, depending on where you are in flight school all the way until you get to your first fleet tour and you're actually established in one place for about four years. You're going to be moving every six to 12 months. You know, you'll show up at Pensacola. You're going to do API. You'll be gone six months after that. You're going to do primary six months later you're gone to Texas and you're there for a year and you move to California like you're gonna move all over the place so relationships are very difficult to maintain uh, in that kind of environment just because you know you're gonna try but it's gonna be long distance and it's probably you're not gonna end up back where you went to flight school unless you go there as an instructor so it's a lot more difficult um, and then once you actually get to your fleet tour it uh, it's hard on families it's hard when you have a wife and kids because especially if they're not uh, from a military background. And even if they are, um, it's the military doesn't necessarily, I wouldn't say they don't care, but they're not going to blink twice uh, when it comes to sending you on deployment, sending you somewhere for a month at a time. Even if you're not on deployment, you may be gone on an detachment for a month, home for a week, gone for a month, home for a month, gone for two months. Uh, and there's not really anything you can do or uh, do about that. So uh, it's, it's difficult, but you got to find somebody who's willing to put up with that, uh, give it a test run through a deployment, for example, 
uh, is what I did. Um, and then uh, it's difficult with kids because even if you're just going to be gone for a month and you're not going to be gone for eight months, uh, Nathan, I'm sure can speak about this more than I can because I've only done detachments with children, but you come back and, and uh, they miss you. They don't want you to leave again. Uh, they don't quite understand what it's like. So uh, family life is definitely hard. Uh, it's not it's not for the faint of heart. Um, friends wise, it's difficult as well. You're going to have a core group of friends that you're going to keep in touch with. And it's really the ones who are going to stick around are the ones who uh, call them low maintenance friends. You know, you can get a hold of them after six months and be like, Hey man, I'm going to be in town. You want to hang out? And they're like, Oh yeah, it's awesome. How are you? You know, they're not going to be uh, requiring you to constantly check in on them because they're going to, they're going to understand that you're very busy. Uh, it all kind of takes a backseat to your career until you're established and you're going to be in one place for a long time. So it's, it's difficult. It's not impossible, uh, but it takes a lot of work. And uh, I've seen a lot of people get bit where they, uh, they take it personally and it, you really can't because like everything else in the military, it's not personal. Very good. Very good. Uh, well, Brian segued me to you, Nathan. I know you're a family man. And uh, other than not being able to help your father-in-law cut the grass and stuff, how has this uh, being a military pilot affected your life? and uh, the lives of, uh, of your children and your wife. Yeah, so um, I got three kids, three daughters, uh, eight, seven, and three. And uh, my last deployment was one where uh, I had to go with, uh, it was actually my first deployment with kids. And, uh, and that was tough on them because like uh, Brian mentioned, they just don't understand. Um, with the other trips, um, and again, I think I saw some of the questions in, uh, in the Q&A there about you know, how long are, are deployments, stuff like that. Um, they vary. Uh, I've been, I was fairly fortunate. Or I felt fortunate that all my deployments were roughly 60 days. Um, and that's, that's easy to do. You know, you don't feel like you missed too much of life being just gone for two months. Um, but it, the downside of that is that you're constantly in a state of, you're constantly in a state of flux. So you're home for two, gone for two. I was home for two, gone for two. Uh, and that wears on the family as well. Just be constantly being in the, in the, the ebb and flow of, of deployment cycle. Um, but again, that varies among aircraft and service there. Um, with, uh, with the, uh, and I've also been, been fortunate to see that how technology has, um, uh, has helped families deal with deployments. So deploying for the first couple of times, you know, we get like one phone call a week and then, you know, you get a phone card, you know, from the Red Cross or somebody like that, you know, go buy a phone card and, um, that allow you to talk for a little bit longer, uh, or a little more often. And then, um, Skype started showing up in like 2010, 2011 timeframe which made it easier because then you could actually see the person you're talking to. And uh, then in 11, I think we got uh, internet in the rooms, which allowed guys to, you know, talk to their wives, talk to their kids uh, via Skype from their room versus in this common area. Um, I actually, in my first deployment, I borrowed a 160th guy's uh, a sat phone and was able to call the wife on that. So uh, throw a little love to the 160th guys there for that. Um, and then now in my most recent deployment in 2016, uh, you know, I was able to FaceTime with the wife uh, on my phone because there was Wi-Fi in the, in the dorms there. So that's, again, technology has made it much easier and, and, and everybody's more connected now, which is great. Uh, but it's still tough when you, when you're not actually physically there to help. Hey Al, I think you're muted. First time I forgot it. Uh, uh, you know, I uh, should know this, but you were you in Civil Air Patrol uh, as a cadet? No, not as a cadet. Um, I joined up, uh, did a, uh, I did it for a couple of years out there in uh, Colorado while I was in, in my time out there. Okay. Uh, were any of the panelists Civil Air Patrol cadets? Okay, and the reason I, I pose that question is we, we did get a question in the chat. Uh, we have some Civil Air Patrol cadets that have joined us, and uh, they were asking about uh, the leadership experience. And uh, I am in Civil Air Patrol. I serve as a, a director of operations of the North Dakota Wing. And I was in ROTC uh, in, in college uh, and went through PLC in the Marine Corps. So I can tell you that my experiences in Civil Air Patrol as a cadet uh, paralleled my experiences in Army ROTC uh, in, in high school. Uh, and to a degree paralleled my experiences in PLC. Um, so uh, absolutely, if you're from Civil Air Patrol, uh, there is a direct correlation, very, very similar programs that will develop great leadership skills in you. So that's a wonderful place to, to pick up those uh, leadership credits, if you will, uh, in CAP. All right, uh, Beth, uh, we'll come back to you there for a question or two, if you've got a couple of audience uh, questions, ma'am. Yeah, 
we've got some, some more great uh, audience questions asking about your decisions to join your specific branch of the military and then also if you were able to select into your airframe what made you select that uh, airframe oh uh, let, let's kind of again go a little bit around the horn so josh i saw you nodding at that one so you want to take a strike at that sir yeah sure um, <clears throat> well i was enlisted in the name four uh, which kind of informed my decision uh, to join the Army. Not that the Navy was bad, it was a great experience, um, but I wanted to be a little closer to the ground, um, and I felt like I would get that more in the Army, uh, especially, like I said, I flew the helicopter one time, it kind of changed my decision too. So um, flying helicopters, flying Apaches is exactly what I wanted to do. So, you know, the Army's the only one with Apaches, um, so that kind of informed my, you know, a decision to join the Army. The UND helicopter flight training program was Army specific too, so that kind of you know, drove me this way. And then um, coming into selection, uh, I felt like I could fly a Chinook in the civilian world, I could fly a Blackhawk in the civilian world if I really wanted to, um, but I would never get a chance to fly an Apache in the civilian world, so I wanted to take advantage of that you know, while I was serving. Very good, thanks. Nick, uh, you and I have had conversations offline about this, so I know you have some very strong feelings about why you chose the Marine Corps. Can you share those with our viewers? I think that uh, it's like you're a Marine first and then like a pilot second. Obviously, like I, I absolutely uh, love flying. It's uh, that's what everyone kind of wants to hear about, but just to kind of be able to know uh, personally like who you're working with on the ground and then uh, understanding all of that and then I don't know I've, I've, I've I chose helicopter like I, I went to UND going to UND I absolutely just fell in love with helicopters I, just, I thought it was the coolest thing and then I'm sure just like Josh I saw an attack helicopter and I was like that's it that is the, the most glorious thing known to man that's what I want to do so it, it was it wasn't hard for me like once I went to UND talked to a few people and it, it, it just like, yes, that, that's exactly what I want to do. And I focus all my attention uh, and then just kind of just went for it and just worked hard every, every step along the way and, and just kept on looking at that big goal and it worked out. It worked out. Right on. There's that enthusiasm. Nathan, uh, I'm going to kind of uh, coke towards you for just a moment. I've got obviously a little bit of gouge on you because we know each other real well and I, I happen to know that you could have gone to any airframe you wanted because of your placement uh, in, in uh, pilot school. So what made you go to the uh, AC-130? Uh, so this answer is pretty easy and that's being a Virginia Tech grad. Uh, at Virginia Tech, being in the Corps of Cadets, just like at uh, a and there, uh, Kevin, um, I have best friends that uh, are in the Army, that are in the Marine Corps, uh, in the Navy, and um, being uh so you know the idea of being able to support guys that i work with or that, that i know um was why i wanted to go uh into the, in the in the specifically to fly gunships um when i was on casual status at langley air force base uh, when i was a first, or when i was a second lieutenant uh, i was in an f-22 unit uh, there at langley and my buddy came out who's an infantry officer and we got you know a little pet the jet thing uh this captain walked us around and uh, at the end of it my buddy goes well what can you do for me as an infantry officer uh, in the F-22. And at that point in time, the F-22 wasn't deploying yet. They weren't even IOC. So you know, I was like, well, you know, you know, keep you know, air superiority clear for you. And my buddy's like, well, okay, for this current fight, what can you do? And uh, he was like, well, you know, um, right now, not a whole lot. And so that kind of sold me on being a, a wanted to fly cast platforms and then uh, specifically gunships uh, with a long order time. And, um, you know, and, and, the, and the capabilities that we carry now, that's, that's, that, that sold me on that. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Josh, uh, I met you over in Korea. And so I know you spent quite a bit of time over there at a U.S. military installation south of Seoul. What was that like? It's uh, different and fun. Um, they call Korea the land of the not quite right. So it's very modernized. Um, you know, it's, it's very, it's almost very American in some ways. It, you know, got technological advances further than us you know the internet's way better things like that um, but uh, it's just a little it's just a little different than america obviously uh, living in a foreign country is fun um, but 
you know, uh, language barrier is always a, always a challenge, um, but uh, it really creates good relationships between you and every other American that is there on post, uh, on base, uh, throughout the peninsula. Um, the Korean partners are really awesome. Um, so it's, it's really fun. It's really about the relationships, especially, you know, over there between, you know, you other Americans and like I said, our, our rock partners over there through the Republic of Korea and rock. Um, so it's a lot of fun. It's a unique experience. Excellent. Thank you. Beth, let's come back to you and we'll finish up the last seven minutes here with some audience questions. Okay, sounds good, Al. One of the questions that came in is, what is essential to have to be successful in pilot training? What advice? Kevin, uh, you want to take a shot at that one uh, since you're, you're in the throes of it now? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so I'd say the one factor uh, that comes in that's uh, common throughout the entire uh, two years of pilot training is time management. Um, there's a lot of distractions in Pensacola, not as many in Corpus Christi, uh, but a lot in Pensacola, definitely. And uh, throughout that entire time, you're going to have to be studying. Studying sometimes seems boring, especially whenever you go over the basic stuff uh, ad nauseum over and over. Uh, but you're going to be expected to know everything and then not forget it. Um, so there's been some times where I'll get to the end of uh, either whether it's primary or advanced or even where I am right now, and they'll start asking me questions about stuff, uh, something uh, knowledge-based from the very beginning of training, and you're supposed to remember it. And that only comes through repetition and uh, just habit, just a habit pattern that you just build over, over a very long time. So time management and, uh, and discipline, that's about it. Excellent. I know our uh, more experienced aviators have all served as instructor pilots, so I'm just going to kind of go eeny, meeny, mo here and pick on you, Brian. Uh, look at your students and tell me, like, uh, what are the attributes of just a great student? What do they show you as an instructor pilot? Well, I'll say something Kevin probably forgot to mention is it's probably helpful to have an older brother who's there to teach you everything you know. Um, but if you don't have that uh, and your name's not Kevin, uh, I would say one of the big things is learning how to accept criticism in the profession that we're all in. There's not really a whole lot of room for error. Kind of like I talked about earlier, not just landing on a boat, but just flying an airplane. You know, if you don't pay attention and you're low and your mission cross check times, you know, three seconds and you get four seconds, then you've uh, you have to be able to take that criticism without taking it personally and you have to accept it and fix it. Uh, if you don't and you have the same mistake and you're doing it three, four flights in a row, it means that you're just not paying attention. Um, so in a nutshell, I agree with Kevin's time management. I agree with, uh, there's a lot of things you could talk about, but if I'm going to point out one thing, I would just say be willing to accept criticism and be willing to work, uh, not almost to a fault, um, towards striving to achieve perfection. Obviously, we're all human. We're never going to have the perfect flight where nothing goes wrong. But if we aim for that, uh, basically aim small, miss small. Uh, so try to be the best you can and don't accept, hey, I'm only 20 feet off altitude. Uh, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. It's like, hey, if you're looking to be on altitude, be on altitude, because if you're doing that, then you're when you're strafing, you're going to be, uh, you know, you're going to be aiming small and you're going to miss small as well. So uh, yeah, uh, be able to accept criticism. Great advice. Uh, Nathan, uh, you got a whole bunch of people sitting behind you when you're an IP, and I know you're focused on uh, the, st the student who's sitting next to you, but you got a whole crew of people that you're going to have to try to train back there. So what's the Air Force perspective and a crew served aircraft? Um, being able to, sorry, so having, so what, what do I want to see in a student, whether it's a student pilot, whether it's a, a student uh, CISO, WISO, uh, sensor operator, um, I want them to uh, come prepared. I want them to have looked at the stuff ahead of time. I want them to have read. I want them to have uh, have some basic understanding of what the whole thing is. You know, the whole thing we're trying to do, just not just their part of it. Uh, that that makes my life a lot easier. Um, if I'm not having to try to teach in the in the airplane, uh, but more so just um, providing opportunities for the crew to work together, that that makes life a lot easier. But if I'm having to try to um, instruct a, a you know a student through something um, and this is more so in the in the mission sets here um, you know if I'm not if I'm, if I'm not having to teach the student systems knowledge in the aircraft because they've read ahead they understand the system then I can teach them how to employ how to um, how to do the job and do the mission versus um, when they don't come prepared 
Excellent. So kind of compositing those two answers, uh, come well prepared and be able to take criticism, Brian. That sounds like that encapsulates it. Beth, uh, what else do we have from the audience, man? I think the last great question we have asks about leadership traits. What are the most important leadership traits in a military pilot? So, uh, Aaron, you want to take a shot at that, man? Oh, man, that's a, that's a hard one for me. I thought you were going to give it to a Marine or something. <laughs> uh, I've actually only been in charge of sailors for like one short or it felt short, like six or eight months uh, during a cruise, I was an AVARM division officer. Um, in the Navy, we just don't really get too much uh, experience with that. We have a lot of other ground jobs and uh, sometimes you'll do it for, you know, half a year or a year or so uh, at my stage in my career. So um, I think something that's really important uh, for all of us is being a good communicator um, and being able to uh, make sure everybody has the information they need to succeed because there's a lot of different information from different places uh, that we all need to put together. So um, good communication skills, I think, uh, will help you be a good leader. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Josh, I know you've led troops. Uh, from your perspective in the Army, how would you answer that question? I'd say being humble, always you know, remaining humble, uh, having some humility when it comes to uh, not thinking that you know everything um, really goes a long way with the people that you work with. Um, I kind of live by three, three rules and tried to teach that to my platoon leader when I was a company commander and uh, really just anybody that'll listen, I guess. But uh, so number one is, you know, do your job. So you always want to be good at your job, be the guy that's out there studying. You know, <clears throat> you don't need to put it in anybody's in anyone's face. Um, but uh, you should definitely be competent. Uh, maybe the second thing is take care of people. So that's, you know, putting others first, being a servant leader, um, you know, doing everything you can to make the people's lives around you easier. And then the other one, like I said, number three is just always stay humble. So, you know, if you're willing to accept criticism, like uh, Lieutenant Commander O'Toole had said, you know, if you're, you know, the guy that can be wrong, um, you'll actually go a lot further than thinking that you're always right when you're in charge, in my opinion. Excellent advice. Well, as I look at it, uh, we're at 8.30 Central Time, so it's time for us to conclude. It just remains for me to thank every one of our panelists and to thank our uh, attendees who came and spent your valuable time to come and listen to the panelists. And I can tell you that I, I sleep soundly at night knowing that professionals like you are out there protecting us. So thank you very much for what you do. God bless everybody. Have a good evening. <laughs>